This is the Monday, July 17th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, we're going to lead a funeral procession with the old time machine, as we pay respects starting with George Washington's crypt at Mount Vernon in Virginia, and end over 200 years later with a salute to Gerald R. Ford in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Returning for a second time travel adventure is Louis Picone author of The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. Elect to visit him online at lewisbacone.com. We previously caught up with Lewis on President's Day at the Church of the Presidents in Long Branch, New Jersey, where seven chief executives worshipped during the Gilded Age. More there than at any place outside the nation's capital. That day, our topic was Lewis's first book, Where the Presidents Were Born, The History and Preservation of the Presidential Birthplaces. We hope you'll find this episode a nice bookend to the first 38 men to serve as our commanders-in-chief. Yes, 38. We only count Grover Cleveland once, since while he rose from the political grave to serve a second non-consecutive term, he has not risen from his physical grave in Princeton. Yet, anyway... From humble stones to towering monuments, every president eventually loses that race against time. As John Quincy Adams said in old age, his body was wearing out under the strain of the years, and he had spoken to the landlord, who had no intention of making repairs. If you love walking in the baby steps or final steps of our presidents, be sure to check out Louis Bacone at facebook.com slash the president is dead. You can also elect to visit him online at lewisbacone.com. That's L-O-U-I-S-P-I-C-O-N-E. As Lewis and I are both from the Garden State of New Jersey, we decided to meet up at one of the hidden presidential jewels of the Jersey Shore, the Township of Ocean Historical Museum, which calls itself an open door to history. You can visit them without paying the parkway tolls at oceanmuseum.org and get a sense of some of the fun history-related events and author readings that they host. There are so many great untold stories in this area, right there in the sand if you're just willing to scoop up a little and sift through it. As Springsteen might have written, down the shore everything's all right, you and your historian on a Saturday night. Well, maybe not, but there is one historian I'm excited to spend time with. So let's meet up with Louis Picone as the nation learns the president is dead. I'm in Ocean, New Jersey at the Township of Ocean Historical Museum. I'm looking at the timeline of the building. John Willie bought these originally 500 acres in 1697. In 1747, his grandson Thomas Willie Jr., built what would become the east wing of the property. It's been expanded in, what, 1835 here. I'm looking at a bunch of the timelines leading up to the current day. In 1999, the 
Township acquired this building. Didn't cost taxpayers anything, they are proud to say. And now today you can come and enjoy it. There's a ton of artifacts here. Our return author is Louis Picone, author of The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. Thank you for making time to meet up with the History Author Show, Lewis. Oh, thank you very much, Dean. Thanks for having me back. We're in a great spot here with so much presidential history all around us. I was looking at some of the books over there, and I joked with you that I didn't have the one on Garrett Hobart, and I said I heard the little devil on my shoulder say, you know, slip it in your bag, take it, nobody will know. And I said, I think they'll know, you know, the angel on the other shoulder (laughs) saying, stupid, how many people do you think come through here and want to grab any of the presidential memorabilia, Grant, all of these local presidents. Residents, not local born, but local that they certainly vacationed, passed through, lived here. Woodrow Wilson, I'm looking at things about FDR, New York's own, just so many things, a little replica of this lovely house. And so we're really surrounded by history right now. And I'm fortunate to be across from a historian that loves presidents. So, Lewis, have at it. Why should readers pick up The President is Dead? Well, thank you so much again. In my book, The President is Dead, I wrote about the final days of the presidents, their deaths, their burials, and like I said, and beyond. And it's a very underexplored area of the presidency. I've read a ton of presidential books, and sometimes I get a little bit disappointed that they kind of wrap up that final chapter of their lives so quickly. So what I've done is that I've explored just those final days, what the presidents did in those final days, how they were treated, and then their passing, their death, And then the public ceremony of their funerals and the memory of their burials and even beyond that, too, because for almost all of the presidents, the story doesn't end with their burials. There's fascinating stories of the public memorials, of attempted grave robbings. So really interesting stories there. When David McCullough wrote his book on John Adams, his acclaimed biography, he said, you know, I kind of got to after he leaves the White House and he said, well, I couldn't just write, he lived 20 more years and then he died. And I thought, well, what, what could he possibly have done that would have compared to the life before? But then looking into it, you find things like the Adams Jefferson letters that now, partially because of that book, we're all familiar with. And when you look at grave sites and graves themselves or places people died, I think of Kathleen Shanahan Macca, who shared her book, Galveston's Broadway Cemeteries, with us. And we talked about how cemeteries, they're not about death, they're about life. And that's very much this. How we memorialize a president tells us a lot about them. Yeah, that was a great episode that you had, by the way. Yeah, one of the things that I like to think in a cemetery is that everyone gets their own historic marker at the end of their lives. So uh, it's one of the things that I enjoyed about cemeteries, about visiting the cemeteries within the book. Uh, That's kind of part of the book, because I write about about the history of their deaths, of their burials, etc. And I also really enjoy presidential places, being in presidential places. Like my first book was about the birthplaces. I enjoyed visiting the birthplaces, presidential libraries, etc. So... Again, an underexplored area. I wanted to write about those presidential places that that you don't normally read about, like where the presidents actually died, where their funerals were held, the funeral train stations where massive crowds came out to see a passing train, funeral homes. So I really tried to get into some of those really lesser known sites, even uh, original burial sites. I found that 15 of the presidents were reinterred over the years, over one third of the president. So visiting those original sites where they were buried is really fascinating too. Often when they needed time to build an actual mausoleum or we're talking going back to, you know, the turn of the 1800s there, you'd have to wait for the ground to thaw, frankly, if you were going to be put into the ground, right? One thing about the place a president dies or gets sick is, unlike the birthplaces where you write that the place where a president was born only became historic in the rearview mirror, That's set apart from a place where somebody who's been a chief executive, like an FDR or a Lincoln or Garfield or Franklin Pierce, Nixon, it says something about what their presidency was and how loved they were when they build a monument like to McKinley, like to Garfield. You know, it's massive. And you say, these people love this man. You know, you say, we must have had some story. And of course, they both did with the assassinations. So what sets those birthplaces apart from, say, now you're looking into a Ford's theater where we lost Lincoln or Andrew Jackson's Hermitage where he died? 
right? Some of your trips overlapped, I'm sure. So I wonder how the research differed on that score. Now you're no longer digging into those sometimes obscure birthplaces, no longer Rutherford B. Hayes, whereas birthplace now is gas station stands in its place. You're looking at places that for the most part, they're marked. You know, there's many more places that are remembered. It's, it's very different, I imagine, researching where the presidents were born versus the president is dead. Yeah. The first big difference is that in the birthplaces book, for so many of the presidents, there was such scant information that I had to work with. And that was part of the fun is just digging so deep to find that information. Just before we get into the places with the presidents, with their death and with their funerals, there's so much, uh, an abundance of information for many of them. For some of the earlier ones, there's not, but many like Lincoln and Kennedy, obviously, there's just so much information. Uh, and for the recent presidents, so one of the challenges in just researching and writing the book was taking all that information and determining what really helped the narrative of the story and what details were important to put in there. Because there was a lot of details with the president's death and with the funerals for some of the presidents. With visiting the sites, one major difference is that I tried to write the book in remembrance that these are sites where people died, the presidents, we look up to them as icons, but they were people too. So I tried to keep that in mind as I was writing the stories of their deaths. And with the places, I also kept that in mind that not a happy birth happened here, but this was a solemn passing that had happened here. But also, just like the birthplaces, with some of the sites where the presidents have died, there's some interesting, really interesting, quirky stories there, too. Like, there's a house where James Monroe died in downtown Manhattan. There was preservationists that tried to save the home for years, and then eventually they turned into almost like hobos were living in the home, it was falling apart. A last-ditch effort, they tried to move the home to another site, realized that the slot they were moving it into was a couple inches smaller than the actual house, and it kind of caved in on itself as they moved in the house. They buttressed it with cables for several years, and then it ended up falling apart. So the site now where James Monroe died in downtown Manhattan, I think it's on Prince Street, it's a clothing store. So there's, even though I'm writing about this, a lot of the places that I write about uh, also have this, those weird, interesting stories. And that's the kind of stuff that I really like to write about. It's almost a secret when you can walk past a place like that or past the little restaurant where Chester Arthur passed away also in Manhattan. You know, the there is a plaque inside sort of the vestibule there. And I mentioned to you that the historic association that put that plaque up doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. So you could walk right by those places a million times and never know because many of these men were just men. They weren't looking to have a big monument. And often you don't know who history is going to love or appreciate until after they're gone. You know, you wouldn't have thought when McKinley died and they built this towering monument with, you know, supposed to look like the hilt of a sword and a reflecting pool in front that was supposed to be the blade. And you wouldn't have thought that in a hundred years that he would be uh, among the more forgotten presidents, among the lesser known presidents. You can try to fight and try to make sure how you're remembered in history comes out the way you want it as a president. But last wishes aren't always respected, even for presidents. And I'm thinking, of number three, Thomas Jefferson, who wanted a very humble monument, or the current battle over the opulent monument that's planned, memorialist plan for number 34, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who is proudly a farm boy from Abilene, Kansas. He didn't want anything huge. He said that was the best thing anyone could ever say about him. He was proudest of that. So I wonder which of the presidents do you think would be most pleased and most displeased with their memorials? You think James Monroe would come back and say, gee, a clothing store here. I'll, maybe I'll get fitted for a <laughs> suit, but gee, you couldn't have given me something. Yeah. Well, James Monroe actually is a real fascinating story because he was buried in New York because that's where he died. He died 1831. It was this very small little cemetery. In, in, I think it's called Second Street Cemetery. And then he was relocated 27 years later down to Virginia. So there he has his death memorial there, which is kind of an odd looking structure, actually. They call it the birdcage. But who would be pleased? I think Garfield would absolutely have to be pleased. James Garfield. He's got this mammoth mausoleum. It's one of the biggest tombs in America. It's absolutely gorgeous in a cemetery in Cleveland. I think he would definitely be pleased with that. I also think Calvin Coolidge wanted a very nondescript small tombstone in his family cemetery, and his is the most simple of all. If you go there now, it's almost tough to figure out which one is Calvin Coolidge's as opposed to the rest of the tombstones there. It's just a very simple, unassuming tomb. I think maybe someone that might have been unpleased is John Tyler. He died 
during the Civil War. He was in the Confederate state of Virginia at the time. He had in his will that he wanted to be buried in Sherwood Forest at his home. During the Civil War, there was other priorities going on. They just decided to bury him in Hollywood Cemetery in Virginia. The governor at the time wanted to turn it into a president's cemetery. That's where they had James Monroe also brought down there. So kind of against his last request, and so that's where he lay now, not in his home of Sherwood Forest. For one other one, I think that Ulysses S. Grant is buried in Manhattan, a mammoth tomb. I think for him, it might have been an emotional roller coaster because that tomb has gone through ups and downs over the years. A big delay in building the tomb. It took him 12 years to build. It was a huge tourist attraction, and people came there to remember Grant. Then it fell into massive disrepair. It was terrible. In fact, I worked for a TV show where we went and shot a bunch of footage there because it was in Manhattan. There are terrible things happening in the, the sarcophagi, and you know, two of them are there, not physically buried there, but they are interned there, and it was mm -hmm. terrible to see all that going on, and they had those sort of... Um, Art Deco benches, whatever that yeah. '70s style with the broken glass, and they were trying you know, really hard to yeah. bring people there. And uh, that was one of the reasons why the family got involved. And there was a very nice letter that the folks on the show got, and thanking us from the Grant family, from the descendants. One of which I, I lives here. He's, he's also an author. I think he writes vampire books. He he's lives here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was among those, but he is kind of a, as many of the descendants are an unofficial biographer of their famous ancestor. And they appreciate it. The government got involved, stepped up, and it's nice to play a part in saving something like that. Now you can go there. It's beautiful with the park, part of the general post-Rudy Giuliani restoration of Manhattan. Now you can go there, sit and play chess, and people skateboard around there. And I think that that's something Grant would have liked, too, as somebody who had a lot of life in him and have fun. It's nice that it's not just a place to be maudlin and just to mourn. And neither is this book, The President is Dead. I don't want people to get the idea that you're going to be crying at the end of every chapter. It really is about life. It's about that little line that's between the day you're born, the day you're dead on your tombstone. You live your life in that hyphen there. Hopefully it's an M dash, not an N dash, a little short one, right? So <laughs> what we all want to have the long life. So as with where the presidents were born. In this book, you include tables and notes, things people can really use, not just indulging yourself there as a writer. You want people to really be able to interact with the book here and with the sites you're speaking about. For example, each chapter starts with a preface called Critical Death Information, which already sounds exciting, and you guide readers through each landmark that you visited. Since, unlike the birthplaces, the graves, say, number 15, James Buchanan, or number 22 and 24, Grover Cleveland, they might not be so easy to find in a cemetery. You just talked about... See? There's the clock at the Township of Ocean Historic Museum. And that was that has a historic plaque on it, too, so it's historic sound. I'll let people come, and they can hear the story behind the clock. But back to the cemeteries, trying to go through there, you kind of did that work for people who pick up your book because they can go into a cemetery. They can track some of these down. So how did you design The President is Dead to make it essential to anyone that's touring those resting places? And as an aside... Tell us how you pick out Grover Cleveland's. You have a fast way to pick that out. <laughs> yeah, Grover Cleveland's is really easy because if you look for the Hawaiian beads that everyone <laughs> uh, or that many people seem to put on there, he was a big friend to Hawaii. So uh, even today, there's a contingent, I believe, on his birthday that will come up from Hawaii and visit the tomb. Maybe not every year, but I know that there's people that make that pilgrimage for Grover Cleveland. He's still beloved. I wanted to make the book so it's accessible where... People can visit these different sites. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a dual book. There's the history of the president's final days and their deaths and funeral ceremony. But then there's also the story behind each site, behind each one of these sites. So I tried to put a lot of photographs in there, a lot of really good photographs. One thing that I did with this book is I put contemporary photographs of all of the sites in there. But I also put historic photographs, too. So you can see... In many of these sites, how they looked at the time when the president had passed away or as they were being restored and how they look now. It can be read the whole book all the way through, but also if you are plan to be visiting a cemetery or one of these historic sites, you can pick out any one chapter and read it and just kind of get the story behind the story. You're not just staring at a tombstone. You really understand the president's final days and the cemetery too, the cemetery history. So I blend that in also. Much more than you would get 
if people think they can just go to Google and look, it's not that easy, especially for some of the more humble ones. You know, people write a little bit about it. You can't find it, but this combines it and serves it up to readers in a way that you do get that story. And if you're just walking by on the street, I mentioned to you, I was walking with my in-laws from Canada down the street there past the Grover Cleveland Cemetery, which is very close, right in the heart there of Princeton University. He has a big connection there to Princeton. And I saw it from the back and I said, oh, that's Grover Cleveland's headstone. And it's far away from the road. But, you know, unless you are crazy, president crazy like you and I, <laughs> Lewis, then, you know, you're not going to recognize it just passing and know the history that's right in front of you. You know, I used to think, well, maybe, you know, Governor Christie goes there and meets him in the middle of the night, you know, just sit in his grave and you know, have a pizza. <laughs> now that we know the whole Hawaiian connection, maybe a pizza with pineapple, although uh, I would think as a New Jersey boy, he probably doesn't have none of us. Uh, he'd be impeached for that yeah. as governor. <laughs> Putting pineapple, but you know, maybe wear a big Gate. Hawaiian shirt. Pizza Gate would bring him yeah. down, not Bridge Gate. <laughs> so your subtitle mentions the final days of our presidents, like President Grover Cleveland, right there in Princeton. In The President is Dead, we read about some of the bizarre experimentation on some of our presidents, for instance, in the first president's last hours. Discuss some of what we today call the quack remedies and the idea of celebrity medicine that did in men like James A. Garfield, who passed away not far from here, right across from the Church of the Presidents. These things did Washington more harm than good. And also for you writing this book, you mentioned there's not a lot of detail in the early presidents. Oftentimes, there just was none because they didn't know what was going on. I mean, when I read about Washington, I found myself screaming at his doctors, will you stop bleeding him already? But, yeah. you know, they didn't know what they were doing. And, you know, they would make these crazy phrases and describe, you know, fainting spells or whatever. They didn't know what was going on. So how did that challenge affect you here in writing The President is Dead? Yeah. First, I'm going to say I have to exonerate Washington's doctors a little bit because Washington was asking to be blood. And when uh, 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 the first... <laughs> okay. Called The first person that he called was a man named Rawlins who would care for the slaves in Mount Vernon because he didn't want to bother the doctors. And he told him, he held out his arm, he said, take blood. So I think Rawlins was hesitant, so Washington even said, take more blood. So it's astounding because then doctors did come and they bled him. And then other doctors came and they bled him. In the end, 82 ounces of blood were taken from George Washington. I like sometimes when I do talks, I'll bring like a two liter bottle of Pepsi and I'll put it down and uh, and there's even more blood that was taken than that two liter bottle of wow. Pepsi but it's a pretty graphic example to plop that on the table so up until Zachary Taylor died in 1850 bleeding was a regular method that they used for treating the presidents also cupping was uh, another one there was a lot of like these medieval blistering and cupping and bleeding these like medieval that seem medieval today at the time they were the yeah. best medical practices but it's interesting now, the Olympians seem to be using cupping again. Yeah, you know, that they, it's kind of coming back. Yeah, <laughs> making a comeback. Maybe there was something to it. And also with Garfield, I mean, Garfield lost like a staggering uh, amount of weight. Uh, I mean, some reports put it as like 130 pounds that he lost, went from over 200 pounds to below 100 pounds by the end. And one of the things that they did or that the doctor did was give him enemas for like eight days. The only way he was fed was... Uh, uh, was he was fed rectally. Yeah. So with McKinley too, they you know they're giving you coffee and whiskey and you know toast like that's it's a, opium, you know, but, but what could they do right? Yeah. Uh, injections of brandy. Yeah. It just seems like this crazy stuff, but at the time, this was the best medicine that they had. Well, he didn't have a great doctor anyway. Doctor, doctor, doctor. Like doctor, uh, doctor, Candace yeah. Millard said, never trust a doctor that's actually named doctor. You know, the guy's yeah. gonna have a full head. That was, and that was a connection to Lincoln's final hours, which people probably know much more about than most presidents. Yeah. Because Robert Todd Lincoln, who was with Garfield, remembered this doctor, doctor from the time that, so, yeah. you know, they said, get me doctor, doctor. Okay. So he came, shut the doors. And that was an example of kind of that celebrity medicine. And yeah. unfortunately, it doomed Garfield, who probably would have survived. And I can't help but think that, you know, the great massive Washington, so yeah. tough, like if they hadn't done the bleeding. But I guess when he yeah. says, cut me, Mick, you you don't <laughs> tell President yeah. Washington no, or he'd be thrashed. So. Yeah, I don't want to do it, Rob. Yeah. But one of the uh, most amazing medical experiments or almost experiment that they did on the president was shortly after George Washington died, another doctor showed up at the house. But Washington was already dead. But this doctor had this idea that it wasn't too late. He had this proposal where he was going to put Washington on ice, 
freeze his body, artificially uh, pump his lungs, pump oxygen into his lungs, and then infuse George Washington with lamb's blood to bring him back to life. Greek doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a running joke with yeah. Greeks. Like a baby. Yeah. But this doctor, and actually, and the name escapes me right now, he went on to design the Capitol building. So this was no quack. Wow. He was, uh, I mean, at the time, doctors had multiple jobs. But yeah, that was and pretty not astounding. not necessarily degrees and not licensed like today. One of the reforms Theodore Roosevelt went through is his job as a police commissioner in New York. There was a kind of a, a revolving table. It was four of them. One of his jobs was Department of Health. So he was in charge of overseeing doctors because anybody could put out a shingle. There wasn't licensing. There wasn't, you didn't necessarily go to medical school. And even if you did, what did the people know? It was very early. And so there was a lot of that experimentation, washing your hands, using different techniques. So we learned that, but it's hard that to think of it because it's easy. I always try not to condescend to the past, but it's yeah. easy to say, you know, what the heck are you doing? But again, to name David McCullough, he says, well, people ask me, didn't they know back then that, that this was horrible or that was, they were doing the wrong thing. And he said, well, the people back then didn't know they were living back then. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. didn't, he didn't say it as condescendingly as I just did, but you know, that was, that's how I heard it to me, reminding me that we know what we know. And I'm sure in a hundred years and people will know much more than we do. And they'll say, well, what the heck? Like in Sleeper with Woody Allen, you know, yeah. come on, drink this coffee, smoke this cigarette. Tobacco is one of the healthiest things for your body. And here's some chocolate. And he's like, yeah. what? I eat tiger milk. He thought all the health food stuff was going to keep him alive. I only ever had brown rice. Yeah. How can everyone be dead? Yeah. You recently wrote a column at Carousel, the blog of Skyhorse Publishing, who publishes here your book, The President is Dead. The headline is Lifting the Lid. Lenin's Tomb and American Presidential Funeral Customs. And I must admit, I wanted to move this up because I was just talking about being a little condescending or being a little full of ourselves. And uh, my first reaction, I must admit, was that we wouldn't mummify a president and put him on display like a dictator like Lenin. But then I recalled Abraham Lincoln's long funeral ride and the bizarre attempt to steal his corpse, this sort of crazy life after death he has, then his being dug up and, you know, peeking in the coffin there. I believe that was Robert Lincoln, wasn't it? Peeked in there and they wanted to see, he had a flag laid on him and yeah. spangled and that kind of thing. So what will readers learn about Honest Abe's life after death in The President is Dead? Yeah, he has the most extraordinary post-death life or life after death. When he was killed in 1865, embalming had just become a practice during the Civil War. So he was the first president that was embalmed. Another innovation there. Yep, yep. Uh, also, through the book, I try to blend in a lot of these innovations of medical practices and funeral practices, etc. So the public was so shocked. He was so beloved in the North where the planners of his funeral decided to retrace the train ride that he took when he became president, where it went from Springfield out to Washington, D.C., took a 1,700-mile train ride, stopped in cities along the way to do speeches. So they wanted to recreate that in reverse. But what they did is that every city they'd get to, they'd have this grand ceremony, this huge funeral procession where they'd bring Lincoln's coffin to either the state hall or to a prominent building. They'd open up the coffin lid and mourners would pass by at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Hundreds of thousands of people marched by throughout the night. So for 19, 20 days, this ceremony went on, and the embalmers went on the train ride. So they'd have to work on the corpse in between, and people would come in kicking up dirt. They'd have to dust off the features. As the face started to slacken, they'd need to adjust. So when I wrote that blog, and the reason that I wrote that blog post about Lenin's tomb and the burial customs was that I was really extremely fortunate. I was invited to a conference in Russia, which was about the presidents and Russian rulers. So I was one of the presidential historians that spoke there. There was a tour planned, but Lenin's tomb wasn't part of the tour. So that's something just being interested in death sites that I wanted to visit. I was there. I started to think about the differences. Obviously, it's a chasm of differences. We don't put our leaders on display and embalm them for 80 years later. But I did think about Lincoln and the post-funeral ceremony and many other presidents also where we've had those open casket funerals just for that desire to see them one last time. And newspapers used to be extremely vivid about the descriptions. Some of them were usually very peaceful and serene. But then with Garfield losing all that weight 
And then they even had just a big problem making his funeral mask where they said splotches of plaster were on his face or, or his death mask. So the first people that saw him were shocked. People were saying, that can't be Garfield. You got all of the lost weight and just he became so shriveled going through this horrible, elongated death. So what I did is that I traced our open casket funeral customs of the presidency into current days, which we don't do anymore. Even when Kennedy was shot, that horrible shooting where his just his body was decimated, the embalmers were planning that this might be open casket. So they spent many, many hours working uh, on the body of President Kennedy in consideration that this might be open casket. It wasn't, thankfully, and then no president since then have even been considered. That's interesting, especially like you said, you know, when you're going to have a wound like that. I mean, that's that's a president. Uh, the, uh, none of the other ones like were instant that were assassinated. But Lincoln, you know, for all practical purposes, it was, but he did linger there for a yeah. while until he passed away. And no, he belonged to the ages and you kind of had a chance, even though it wasn't much, it was a chance for the news to spread and not, not quite as jarring. I can't imagine wanting to see it. In fact, I've noticed that if you do look online, they have some pictures of the autopsy and that kind of thing. And I think do we really need to have those. I've worked with one of uh, RFK's sons and I say, you know, I think of him and I think, you know, he doesn't need to be Googling and seeing that. And certainly at the time, John F. Kennedy Jr. and stuff, we don't need to see our presidents in that state. And fortunately, we didn't have photography for a lot of them and seeing things. There is one of Lincoln in his casket, of course, but that's it. Yeah, there was actually many taken, but Secretary of War Stanton ordered that all of them be destroyed. So that one was turned into him to destroy. For some reason, unbeknownst to history, that was one photograph that he saved. And then some doing archival work, I think like 50, 60 years ago, happened to come across it inside of a book. Uh, and that was the story of that photo, which was in City Hall in New York. My guest is presidential historian Louis Picone, and we're joining you from the Township of Ocean Historical Museum in Ocean, New Jersey, which you can visit at oceanmuseum.org, or next time you come down the shore, you can check it out. You'll find some intriguing historical and presidential artifacts here, great pot-bellied stove in the back, Ulysses S. Grant's chair, and right behind me where I'm sitting now, the American flag that lay on President James A. Garfield's casket. As we've mentioned a few times here in our episodes on this particular area, this is where President Garfield came for that unfortunately agonizing death that Lewis was just talking about and the failure of his doctors, the infection, the probing with the dirty fingers, all those things that he suffered after his short presidency. He finally succumbed to the assassin's bullets and that was one of these cases where he has a funeral train, he leaves here and McKinley having been a assassinated veterans of both sides of the Civil War, McKinley being our last Civil War president, standing on the side of the tracks and saluting them. It's a very poignant moment in history, and it's nice we can see things like the flags. There are also flags from some of these temporary resting places that you talked about, Lewis, aren't there? That must be nice for you to be able to find those, I would think, along your travels. Yeah, yeah. It amazed me how many of the presidents, doing my research, how many of the presidents were moved over time. Like Lincoln, there was two temporary tombs for Lincoln. And the slab, the concrete slab that the coffin was placed on uh, originally before he was moved from one temporary vault to the next temporary vault, that's been preserved. Do they still use that? Is that the one they sometimes use for state funerals? Yeah, or no, they the don't Kennedy use that one, one anymore. One. I don't think when so. When you lie in state, there, there's something about the oh. one that, when you lie in state. Sorry, I think. That's the catafalque. Uh, yeah, that one was built for Lincoln, this pine tar podium where they placed the coffin, and that has been used over the years. And they still have that. It's in the basement of the Capitol building, which is uh, another interesting twist because when they built the Capitol building, they built a crypt in the basement that was intended to be for George Washington. They wanted to relocate George Washington's remains from Mount Vernon. So there was a lot of back and forth family, whether they were going to agree to it or not. Eventually, they decided to leave Washington where he is at Mount Vernon. But you can still see this Washington crypt. It's not part of the tour, but I asked if I could go see it, and they were nice enough to take me there. Uh, and you can see that catafalque in the crypt, the Lincoln catafalque in the Washington crypt. The Garfield Cottage stood across from the Church of the Presidents in Long Branch, where seven of our presidents vacationed. Only in your state wrote that there's no chapel in the world like it, in part because it is the place more presidents worship than any outside our nation's capital. 
For more on that historic site, surf over to churchofthepresidents.org. And while you're online, check out Louis Picone at facebook.com slash the president is dead. You can also pick up a plethora of presidential Picone at lewispicone.com. Our topic this week is Lewis's book, The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. A commenter on Goodreads Review wrote of your book, Lewis, quote, One unique aspect which adds the flow of history to the book is the decision of the author to place the president's stories in the sequence of their passings, rather than a straight order in which they serve. By doing so, it provides some surprises for the reader. For instance, that the first president to die after FDR was JFK nearly 20 years later, unquote. Lewis, let's talk about that format a little. There are periods in history where we have had no living ex-presidents and and other times when we go for great stretches without a funeral. I remember Nixon. It was in 1994. We hadn't had one in so long. We hadn't had one since Truman, I guess, was it? Since LBJ. Who was okay, shortly LBJ. After Truman, yeah. So that's a long time. That's 20-some years. I think it was 21 years. The longest stretch was between Washington and Adams and Jefferson. So that was 26 years. That was the longest stretch. We haven't matched that yet. It's interesting. I was just doing uh, last year, I realized that we had just passed the longest stretch where a president hadn't died in office. It was like, I think, last October. So between Kennedy and today, the longest other stretch, I believe, was when William Henry Harrison was the first president to die. So we just passed that period of 50 some odd years. So right now we're riding that. And hopefully we do for many, many (laughs) more years. When a president is slain, it's happened four times in our history or it dies in office like Harrison. But as far as the ones that were murdered, there's this outpouring of grief. And I wanted to ask about that. What do those historical markers for Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy, those are numbers 16, 20, 25, and 35, what do they do right in your view to memorialize them? And what would you change about them with your view now? I mean, if we are unfortunate again to have a tragedy like that. Again, what do you think people get right and wrong when they act in the moment? As far as the historian's point of view, how how best to memorialize these men that we lose tragically? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I found about death, it's not that surprising, but it's a taboo subject on many of these markers. Like there's a marker at the site where Chester Arthur died, the home where he died. And there's no mention that he died there. And most of the sites are like that, where they really stay away from death. As far as the assassination sites, there has been a lot of reluctance to recognize these sites. Personally, I think they're historic, a subtle marker, I think is appropriate, but it's very interesting, the different sites. At Lincoln's site where he was assassinated, Ford's Theater, I mean, that was a business, that was a theater, and the theater owners, uh, originally, they were thought to be involved in the plot, but once they were exonerated, eventually, after a respectful period, they wanted to reopen the theater, and they got death threats, so... Uh, Eventually, the federal government purchased the building, and the building was used to store records. Eventually, there was uh, another tragedy where a floor collapsed and people were killed inside the building, government workers. But that site, still over the years, they've kind of struggled how to be a functional theater and how to properly recognize the fact that Lincoln was shot there. Like we had mentioned William McKinley earlier, years later, there was just a small, almost unnoticeable marker that was placed near the site where he was assassinated. The only one that's completely unacknowledged at all is where James Garfield was shot in Washington, D.C. It was inside of a train station. The train station isn't there anymore, so you really can't find the exact spot. What I'd found was a report that city planners did many, many years ago, kind of joke around, it must have been a pretty slow work day, where they found the approximate spot in the middle of, I believe, Constitution Avenue where Garfield would have been standing when he was shot. But there's no marker there. I uh, actually included a picture in the book of myself standing at that spot just to show where it would have taken place. The Garfield site not being marked and the McKinley site of his assassination anyway, of them being shot, they didn't die there like instantly like Kennedy or just across the street like Lincoln did. They died a, a ways away. So the idea that it's not marked or that one is barely marked and the other one for McKinley where he died is also obliterated 
Garfield would have suffered the same fate, really. We spoke a little bit about Bruce Frankel, and he was a young kid, what, eight years old, starts deciding that the cottage where Garfield died should be somehow marked. Otherwise, both places, where he was shot and where he died, would have been obliterated to history. That seems just impossible. And it shows, I think, how people, just with a passion for history, it's one thing nowadays just to post it on Facebook and get indignant. But people really can make a positive difference about remembering the historical figures they love and involve other people. Milburn House is where President Number 25, William McKinley, lost his fight to survive the assassin's bullet. It was knocked down in the 50s and is today a parking lot, unlike Garfield, where it was lost to a fire. It's just tragic when you think about it, but sometimes these buildings do fall into disrepair. One thing that happens at the time is Far from being forgotten as it is maybe a century later, at the time people go and they trample your bushes and they cut wood off the stage where you were, where they think you were shot. In McKinley's case, he actually wasn't on the stage. He was down in front of people. But in the building, they start taking stones, weakening the structure, all this stuff that people do. So that, so that building loses its chance to survive, and we can't go and sit in McKinley's sick room and look at the trees. They try to draw the curtains at one point, and he says, you know, the trees are so beautiful. Let me leave it open. I mean, you and I would love to look out that window. Closest we could come here is to pick up the president is dead and get some of those stories. See the picture, look where the, where the window is marked, this kind of thing in history. But I wonder... What goal did you have there in your book? What was your thinking when you said, I want to be able to bring people back to these forgotten sites or places like Garfield, like McKinley, like some of the other presidents where there's really just not much there, but also not be what one author described as maudlin, where Dealey Plaza is just focused on Kennedy's death and then their life becomes just defined by this gunshot of somebody, you know? So how did you handle that? What did you hope to do for people who can't go and stand in the place? Yeah, I wanted to, yeah, again, it's kind of like the birthplaces when these sites aren't there anymore. They're historic sites. They're so important to our presidential history. So I wanted to tell the story. Some people might still want to go and see a marker where the McKinley home was, the Milburn home where he passed away. But I wanted to tell the story there is that great sense of place when you go visit the actual home and you know what happened there and you know what other people walk there. So I was trying to do the best I can to recreate that sense of place. So people that do visit there, they know a lot more than just a sign on a street, which is going to be 50 or so words to describe what happened there. I want to give the full story. I mean, like you'd said, like with the relic hunters, they're just fascinating that people would pick up pieces of grass or pick up sticks or break off pieces of shingle from the home. These really fascinating sites that I wanted to tell that story of. Listeners may be familiar with that plot, the Steel Lincoln's corpse. But in The President is Dead, I had to say, who in the world would try to steal poor little Benjamin Harrison's remains? That was shocking to me. Yeah, Rufus Cantrell. He's the man. <laughs> you know, the actual guy. <laughs> he's, he's the who in the world that will want to do it. So shortly after Benjamin Harrison passed away in 1901, And it was like a couple days after the family had gone through his will, the police notified him that there was a plot to steal his body. So 1901, it was a different time from today where there was a concern of grave robbing. Benjamin Harrison's father, his remains were stolen. I visited the tomb of William Henry Harrison, and I was lucky enough where the woman that was there responsible for it brought me inside, and she had told me, too, that that site was also there was fear that someone would steal the body. So because of grave robbing, doctors would work on corpses. So there was a fear of grave robbings. With the presidential layer on it, with Lincoln, there was a plot to steal his body and then hold it for ransom. It was a gang in Chicago where their ace counterfeiter was put in jail. So they came up with this crazy plan of stealing Lincoln's body and then exchanging it to release Benjamin Boyd was his name, to release Benjamin Boyd and we'll give you back Lincoln's body. Was there liquor involved? Yeah, I'm sure there was. (laughs) You know, they plotted it at a bar in Chicago. Uh Yeah. (laughs) But with Benjamin Harrison, Rufus Cantrell, his plot was he was going to make it look like people had stole the body for medical use. He was going to steal the body of Benjamin Harrison put it in a doctor's office. And then when the inevitable outcry came and they were looking for the body and offered a reward, then he'd stand up, say, I found the body in the doctor's office. Where's my reward? So that was his plot. And actually, there was attempts to also rob Andrew Jackson's grave, too. It was one morning where they came out and they saw there was a hole dug. And I don't think that they ever found that perpetrator. 
Yeah, well, with Paul Cahan, we were talking about his book, The Bank War, about Jackson, and one of his top three fears is zombie Jackson. So I can't imagine <laughs> it would be like one of those old Twilight Zones. There was one with Lee Van Cleef, and he thinks the hand reaches out of the grave and grabs him. You know, yeah. Old Hickory probably dragged. You said they didn't find the perpetrator. Look in the grave. He probably reached up, grabbed yeah. the guy, pulled him down there. And he's uh, roasting right now. The old yeah. Hickory loved nothing better than the shooter beat up somebody. So there you go. Uh, interesting story about Zombie Jackson. So he was on his deathbed. He was surrounded by his family. What they used to call a good death back in the Victorian era. You're able to say your final farewells to everyone and tie up your loose ends. And you're surrounded by loved ones when you breathe your last breath. So his doctor was there. His family was there. And Andrew Jackson finally slacked. And the doctor announced Andrew Jackson is dead. All of a sudden, Jackson opens up his eyes. What are you talking about? I'm not dead. I just passed out. <laughs> I just fainted. <laughs> and then they go on to talk about these final talks that he gave with his slaves, with his children. And they say that he spoke eloquently about religion and about the afterlife for 30 minutes. And it's just amazing the way that it was described, where one second he was mistaken for death, and two minutes later, now he's speaking for a half hour. So yeah, so it was almost Zombie Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been Zombie, yeah. It reminds you a little bit of another general president with Dwight D. Eisenhower, and he's in his hospital bed, and he asks his son, I believe, to help yeah. another man to lift him up, and they're so careful with him, and he's like, strong men come on he's yeah. looking at the side like, come on pick me up you know make me sit up so he sits up he says his goodbyes like he talked about and he says okay i'm ready closes his eyes and is gone yeah that's just something one of these guys commanding death right yeah he's berating his son and his doctor because they didn't <laughs> oh, they the weren't strong the enough guy, to yeah. pick him up <laughs> <laughs> it's nice i want to go out berating somebody yep, <laughs> to yeah you. general to the end <laughs> yeah in 1885, nearby in Long Branch is where President Ulysses S. Grant felt the first sting of throat pain that turned out to be ultimately the fatal cancer that would take his life. Talk about Grant's fight to stay alive and this amazing story. People may be familiar with it, but if they're not, one of the stories you'll get here, the kind of stories you'll get in The President is Dead, I don't think there's any that's more inspiring and sad moving grant here he is dying knowing he has cancer knowing he doesn't have long and he's writing against the clock yeah very humble man very beloved and he had a double tragedy very late in his life one is that he was involved in a ponzi type of scheme it wasn't ponzi yet but a type of pyramid scheme with an investment firm that he had actually lent his name to grant and ward it all collapsed and he was bankrupt and he had that uh, around the same time. Yeah, he bit into this peach over here at Long Branch. And he felt this extremely sharp pain, sharp enough where he needed to summon some local doctors. They told him that he's got some issues in his throat. Go see your regular doctor in New York. Found out that he had throat cancer. So obviously cancer in, in 1885 was pretty much close to a death sentence. I worry every time I eat a peach, so it's not, yeah. all, it's not all fun and games, everybody, to know so much about presidents. you got to watch out. Meanwhile, his family's bankrupt, and he wanted to leave his family with the financial means to continue, because he actually wasn't just bankrupt, he was deeply indebted, because just a day or two before the whole scandal came out, he was convinced to borrow $150,000 to then loan to this firm to keep themselves solvent, when he thought that, yeah, this was just, we need to get over these couple of days, and then we'll be fine. So he was a man of his honor. He wanted to repay the debt. He wanted to make sure that his wife was taken care of. So he'd always written some articles for Century Magazine. People had been telling him for years they wanted him to write his life story. He was always resistant to it. He wrote these articles about certain battles of the war. But finally, he realized that this is a great way to get the financial means to support my family after I'm gone, which he knew wasn't going to be that long. Interestingly enough, Mark Twain helped him get a good publishing contract, and he just erased uh, against time, where he was writing his memoirs as the cancer was getting worse and worse, when he was no longer able to speak, because he had someone that was transcribing for him as he was speaking. He'd write it in notes. It was in the summer, and someone offered their cottage to him in northern New York to go get some mountain air, because he was struggling from the oppressive summer heat. So he went to Mount McGregor, which is just north of Saratoga Springs, to this cottage, and he continued to work on his memoirs. He finished in mid-July, and then about seven, eight days later, he died. And his doctors were almost concerned that he would finish. Grant wanted to finish so he'd wrap up these memoirs, and he was so diligent, too. Even He wanted to edit, re-edit, to make sure that they were right. 
and his doctors were concerned that once he finishes writing this book, he's going to lose his will to live. And really, that's what happened. It was so shortly after finishing these memoirs that he passed away. And thankfully for the family and thankfully for us that we have these memoirs where you see his strategy and his sense of humor and his humility and his challenges. And the family was well taken care of. They, it was about $250,000 that the family got to pay off the debts and then live comfortably. And he dies before the book is published. Yep. And it's a kind of an interesting little historical detail there is Twain, as you mentioned, helped them publish it. And they put a print of the general signature in the front of the books. And so, okay, now 150 years have passed. And every now and then somebody will come up and think that they have a signed copy, but it's not possible. It's just a print. And I was actually at a presidential site, which I won't embarrass them by saying this. <laughs> it was not a grant site, so not related to that. They said, oh, we have a book. And they were very kind and nice to show it to me. And they were wearing the gloves and everything because they thought <laughs> that it was a signed first edition. And so I had to kind of gently break the news to them and say, well, it's it's not really. They're all printed like that. It's still very nice to have a first edition, but yeah. it's not possible that Grant would have signed it. So that's a, that's a little takeaway for everybody if anyone ever tries to, especially if they try to sell you one. It's not a, it's not a genuine U.S. Grant signature. Yeah. There's fascinating stories about, which aren't in my book, but that I've read about, uh, about the whole counterfeit presidential signatures that have been on eBay that people that made careers out of counterfeiting Washington signatures. I do have a Garrett Hobart signature, Vice Thanks. President Garrett Hobart. Our, maybe I'll loan it here if the museum is interested. The Ocean Historical Society would like to post it. We could get it framed, yeah. put it up. And then when they're hanging that, I'll steal that Hobart biography <laughs> that we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so. Last words, like last tweets, they hold a special fascination for people, especially when we're talking about presidents. You always want them to say something. In fact, I believe Pancho Villa's last words were, oh, my God, don't tell them it ended like this. Tell them I said something. Mm -hmm. He was very, very keen to have said some last words. So I wonder for you, Lewis, what have you learned in your research about facing our mortality with dignity? Just like Grant did, Grant, is that certainly an inspiring story. You're researching your book, though. What what do you learn about it in your own life? What do you hope readers will take away from this book? Not just about death, but we say it's a journey of life. It's an example there. How do, how do you learn about facing our mortality from your research? Yeah, I think a couple of things. One is that these men, for their foibles and their faults, which we all have, I mean, most of them did tremendous things. And they lived good lives. And they all seemed comfortable at the end that they'd done the best they can. Many of them did. I mean, some of them were very poetic final words. Some of them were final words that, in doing my research, I found that they weren't really the final words. Right. Uh, Jefferson, in fact, does not really write the finals. Yeah, Jefferson and Adams, both of them, were said their final words were speaking of each other. They and, talked more after that. Yeah. So that's the other thing, too. I found that these guys are uh, these presidents. So many are larger than life, but they were human too. And sometimes their final words were water or I'm in pain. This hurts. Uh, yeah, screaming, unfortunately. Or yeah, yeah. FDRs, I have a tremendous headache. I right? have a tremendous headache. Yeah, in warm springs. Well, we can't all go out on Millard Fillmore's The Nourishment is Palatable. I mean, now <laughs> yeah. that's memorable. Yeah. Last words. <laughs> Well, for our last words, I'd like to put an epitaph on our conversation today. As I always say when we meet up, Lewis, we could talk all day about presidents and probably will. We'll continue this discussion via email, Twitter, your Facebook page. But I wanted to give you a chance for a final word. If you could take our time machine and put yourself at any presidential deathbed, maybe one of those that you don't know much about, which one would you learn what their last moments were about and be able to pay your respects to? One of the ones that I'd uh, I'd like to go back to, just because there was such little information about it, was Martin Van Buren's death, which probably seems strange with all of the presents that that's the one I want to go back to. But he died 1862 in the middle of the Civil War, and just the obituaries are just so disappointingly sparse about him that you'd want to go back and pay more respect for a man that was president of the United States of America. 
Yeah, the little magician. He is a compelling figure. It would be nice to a lot of them that died during the Civil War, during Great Upheaval. It's easy just to sort of for them to be forgotten. So Mm -hmm. that's an interesting choice. I wouldn't have picked him. I didn't really think of it. But Mm -hmm. as we said, you know, a lot of the biographies did just say, "Okay, he was president. Then he lived another X number of years. And that's it. He died. He didn't do much, but just hang around Lindenwald in his case. And the road that actually does lead to Broadway leads up from Broadway to Albany. Very cool. Very beautiful place in the Hudson Valley. Albany Post. Road. Yeah, folks want to go visit it. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Another president that I'd like to go back and see there and be there at the moment of death is Warren G. Harding. There's been a lot of conspiracy theories and rumors over the years about what happened to Warren G. Harding. He was on a trip throughout the country. He called his uh, journey of understanding as he was campaigning for the 1924 election. And he got sick and died very suddenly at a hotel in San Francisco. There's been conspiracy theories that is doctor killed him, that his wife killed him. And what I found was amazing was that right away those conspiracy theories started. There was a reporter for the New York Times that the morning after the death started to realize, everyone I talk to, these stories aren't quite syncing up. Whether Florence was in the room, whether she wasn't in the room, even the time of death was wildly varied. You think about like noting like the moment that he died. And there was theories that the doctor was giving him like these strange medications over his illness. And this was a Dr. Sawyer that was his hometown doctor that he brought to the White House. So that's one that I'd love to go back to and be a fly on the wall, on the hotel wall to see exactly what happened. But it's one of the of the really fascinating stories about the presidential deaths. Well, Louis Picone, thank you for joining me at the Township of Ocean Historical Museum to discuss The President is Dead. It's a stone's throw from the stone marking the spot where President Garfield passed away. So it was a great place to meet up, talk about the lives of our presidents and how we remember them after they're no longer with us. Best of luck with the book and the companion, Where the Presidents Were Born. Thank you so much, Dean. This has been a pleasure. Again, the book is... The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even navigate through the Amazon banner on our homepage anytime you want to buy something from Amazon. For those few extra clicks... Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. Once again, my thanks to Louis Pacon for spending an afternoon at the Jersey Shore with us and for bringing along all those presidents. I also want to thank the Township of Ocean Historical Museum and remind you to visit lewispacone.com and oceanmuseum.org for more. You can also follow their Facebook pages, to keep track of the many history-related events they've got shaken all year long. I follow a lot of Facebook pages, and sometimes you won't hear from them maybe for a year. These are two pages that are active, and it's always something interesting. And while you're clicking around on the internet, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or on our Facebook page. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us on the Garden State Parkway, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same on the east. Sign west, sign things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.